Hey everybody, it's Kyla. Welcome to my channel where I talk about the stock market and the economy amongst other things. We have a special co-host today. I'm super excited for her takes on the macro economy, but we're going to be talking about Zoltan. We're going to be talking about the labor market. We're going to be talking about the Federal Reserve and kind of this broad distrust and nihilism that is a big thematic across not only the economy, but society at large. So beginning with Zoltan, he published a pretty intense piece, as he does, uh, titled War in Industrial Policy, which the big takeaways were kind of around the things that the world is going to have to do over the next couple of years, which is rearming, reshoring, restocking and investing and rewinding the grid. So basically he's like, we're going to have to defend, we're going to have to blockade, it's going to be much more defensive. We're also going to have to reshore all the production that we do. We're going to have to reinvest in commodities because turns out things are scarce out here. We're going to have to rewire the grid because hello, energy is a nightmare. We dove further into the importance of commodities, which have been underinvested in, as we can see in Europe. He's talking about this changing world. Trust has evaporated from all corners of modern society. People are going to start duking it out because things are inherently unstable. That's kind of like the broad thesis that he has. Has. And that's not great. This thematic of domestic protectionism, I think, is actually really accurate because it's shown up in things like French shoring, it's shown up in OPEC cutting production. It's a world of scarcity that we do exist in, and we're sort of starting to have to reckon with that as we face that scarcity head on. But I wanted to explore this concept of changing macro on a more micro level, from the level of workers who sort of get chucked around in these broader conversations. I think there's something really interesting happening with the way that we work and how we work and how that distrust shows up in workers. Quiet quitting. Um, <laughs> have you heard of it? What a term, right? It's like, if you do your job, you're basically quitting. If you do everything you're supposed to, that's not enough. It's this idea that you're supposed to do even more. You're supposed to go above and beyond. You're supposed to put everything into a job that maybe you are not that passionate about. Maybe you don't feel like it's paying you enough, but you're supposed to do that. And if you don't, it's this thing called quiet quitting. Victoria from Politico had a great tweet on it. People act like we've only just realized life should be about more than just work when actually economic conditions conditions are just giving us space to learn that. I think that's an important point is because the economy has been okay-ish, people now have a lot more flexibility to try things out, right? There's an aspiration mismatch where a lot of people just don't want to be managers according to HBR. So they want to collect the paycheck and they want to go home and they just want to be content with the life that they have. That's completely reasonable. There is a life outside of work for so many people and because the economy has done what it's done over the past couple of so years, we're able to explore that even more. What I think is kind of interesting about that it's like numerically there's probably a productivity surplus that comes from people putting that nose to the grindstone and giving it at their all for people who do want to scale the corporate ladder there probably is on the margin some benefit accrued to corporations because people do more than they're paid for does that have an impact on broader success of firms and how much overworking versus quiet quitting are firms able to take on so the labor market is strong right now enabling these elements of quiet quitting as victoria highlighted there's a mismatch in strength though like a lot of companies are not able to find workers that are qualified for the business that they're hiring for. People, especially qualified people, now have more power in the employment market. The Fed manufacturing surveys highlight this. The employment index remained moderately positive. There's been overall increases in employment. Employment is expected to pick up. The labor market is doing okay right now, giving workers more power in the conversations that surround their work, which is a good thing. Workers are demanding more in more ways than one. Because of the changing labor market, it seems that people are discovering their human value as well as the monetary value of their work. But there's still this underlying passion crisis fueled by a broader distrust. So with the human value, the Wall Street Journal published a piece examining how people that lost their jobs are very quickly able to find new ones and even better paying ones. And if you lose your job, you're still able to go back out into the labor market and be like, actually, I know my value as a human now. And we've seen a lot of turmoil in tech employment, but labor demand is still strong. There are nearly two job openings for every unemployed person seeking work. Then there's the monetary values. The New York Fed published their labor market survey data this the last week, which included the reservation wage, which is the lowest wage that that respondents would be willing to accept to take on a new job and expectations increased across the board. So people want more money for the work that they're doing, which is totally valid. Like hello inflation. It ticked up from 68K in July of 2021 to 72K in July of 2022. The thing is like, what is your value? There is a good paper that explores how people don't really know their value in the labor market, highlighting that if workers had correct beliefs, at least 10% of jobs concentrated in low wage firms would not be viable at current wages. Wow. Like, oh my God, everybody is getting underpaid. And of course that goes back to margin, productivity, 
productivity surplus and like how corporations are able to benefit from that that goes into the stock market but passion value and choosing a major even in college it's just kind of an aside but salary is the main focus for a lot of people people are more willing to choose stem and medical majors and they do that to land a job there was an article in the atlantic from ben schmidt called the humanities are in a crisis and it points out sort of the mismatch of this there's an increase in the for the money aspect of it so ben kind of highlights that even the major that you choose doesn't really dictate your earnings potential that much like humanities majors don't make that much less than x major i think one thing that kind of strikes me about the whole quiet quitting thing is this clear lack of passion for work which totally makes sense a lot of jobs don't really have things for people to be passionate about but is passion disappearing entirely so i wrote about the passion crisis a few months ago and i was talking about how we really do need more opportunities to explore when we're younger you're fed through this industrial revolution style education system and it's not the fault of the teachers it's just kind of like what we're used to but because of that i do think that people sort of become really disenchanted with learning and i think our passion crisis is broadly a function of tapping into sort of the uncomfortable parts of ourselves and trying to find what we love but we're never really taught to explore what we care about unless you have like really great teachers right and of course like there's a lot of really great teachers out there and they're they have their own issues that they're dealing with like common core and school boards and tests and stuff i think a world where we're able to explore our passions where we're taught it's okay to care caring is kind of an act of rebellion in a world that is just constantly trying to put you down i think it's also interesting to reflect on like how many people don't really know what they care about and i think that lack of passion shows up in broader nihilism and distrust in the world around them so going back to zoltan's macro thesis on distrust i think that we're starting to see that in the micro thematics as well and to be clear i don't think a lack of passion for work means lack of passion in general. I just think that there is a group that has a lack of passion for neither and distrust in institutions, which I think applies to a lot of people, including myself sometimes, but it's important to reflect on. And so the Fed had their big Jackson Hole meeting this week, which markets hated, of course. Powell's eight minute speech erases 78 billion from the richest Americans. The main takeaway was like, oh, we're gonna keep on raising rates, but Jerome Powell did address the labor market, highlighting that some softness was going to need to happen in order for them to really battle out with inflation they're going to cause some pain. And he also highlighted this concept of rational inattention, which I really loved, which is people paying attention to inflation kind of because they have to. It takes up their time and their brain processes, and that's something that the Fed has to battle in the form of inflation expectations. And the Fed is very focused on fighting inflation. In fact, they mentioned maximum employment, which is the other half of their dual mandate. Jerome Powell mentioned it zero times in his Jackson Hole speech. So they are very, very focused on fighting inflation. Of course, the old debate of like, is raising rates even the right tool to use here? And I'm like, oh. it, and my answer is yeah, of course. If you want to kill a spider, you can burn the house down to get rid of it. <laughs> Could you ethically capture it in a cup and release it outside? Yes. But if your main goal is spider eradication, burning down the house does the same job. And the Fed is sort of on the path to burning the house down. I think that they're doing the absolute best that they can, but they don't want to be wrong again. You know, people are making fun of them for the transitory stuff. Now they're like, okay, well, we're going to freaking raise rates, dudes. There's so much that they can't do, right? They can't fix supply chains. Companies are passing off costs to consumers. They can't really go to corporations and be like, hey, eat that cost. They can't fix globalization or lack of oil. The dollar has become a lot stronger because of their hiking path. There's a whole conversation to be had around that and the impact that that has on emerging market nations as well as domestic corporations. Any way that the Fed turns, they're bumping into the walls. The house is slow. <laughs> crumbling. Zooming back out into labor, corporations seem to be getting ready to respond to weaker conditions. PwC survey found that 50% of companies have reduced headcount, 40% are rescinding job offers. A lot of it is confusing, right? It's jobs that need to be filled, but like, are those jobs going to be there in a few months? And will them doing that result in reallocation of labor entirely? Or are we going to have to see like a broad reskilling of people as different jobs become quote unquote more important than other jobs? Does the fact that student loan debt forgiveness happened and the structure changes to how students take on debt encourage more people to seek out higher education. Who knows? 2008, we kind of saw that theme. Maybe it'll be similar here. As Brian points out, no real pain has happened yet. There's still a long way to go with all of this. The Fed could be all bark and no bite until we actually see softer labor numbers, but for now, they seem intent on a bit of arson. So final thoughts, my TikTok comments are my main sentiment indicator. Also the comments on this YouTube video, but um, somebody commented that they were pretty frustrated with a group of people, you know, gathering in Jackson Hole and being like, this is 
the spell that we're gonna cast on the economy today. I totally get that because it does feel really removed from society to like watch these elders, you know, gather in a circle and talk about the direction that they think the economy should go. And that's just how it is. Like we have a central bank, so we have a centralized economy, but I think there are some unintentional theatrics about it, like I wrote about last week, and it can make it feel like we're just puppets on an economic stage, which we kind of are. I truly think that the Fed is doing the best that they can with the tools that they do have, but as I have said, and many of others have written about, their best might not be good enough here. And I think using the labor market as this tool, which is unavoidable, but I think using it as a tool has long lasting morale consequences and enhances distrust in a world that is already losing trust in literally everything. And Neil Holborn is one of my favorite poets <laughs> and his stuff is brutal, but this expert from uh, this expert, ooh, what word is that? This part from one of his poems, this is not the end of the world, feels connected to this piece on the labor market and worker value, etc. Isolation is not safety, it is death. If no one knows you're alive, you aren't. If a tree falls in the forest and no one's around to hear it, it does make a sound, but then that sound is gone. I'm not saying you will find the meaning of life in other people. I'm saying other people are the life to which you provide meaning. Thanks for hanging out. Thanks so much for spending time with me. I hope that you're doing okay out there and the Fed chair says goodbye. Hey, Moo. Ha <laughs> ha.